not colorfully displayed on the grocer's shelf, you perhaps think of it as a delightful adventure in eating. But do you ever think of the real adventure behind that can of The dramatic, suspenseful story of the men who spend at least six months out of every year of their lives searching risking their lives in one of the sea's great delicacies to the family table. The tuna story begins in San Diego, California, the home of America's tuna, the largest tuna port in the entire world. Here at the Embarcadero are tuna clippers ready to go down to the broad Pacific after the wily skipjack and the yellowfin. The modern tuna clipper is a gleaming testimonial to the scientific progress of marine engineering. Since the precious cargo of tuna must often remain aboard for months at a time, the ship's hold is a series of refrigerated vaults capable of holding 350 tons of tuna, quick frozen within minutes after the catch. The clipper is powered with an eight-cylinder diesel engine having a cruising speed exceeding 12 knots. The ship's two-way radio maintains constant contact with shore stations and with other ships in the vicinity. To all weather navigation, the clipper is equipped with radar. Thus, the skipper is able to scan the horizon with unerring precision rather than rely on the old method of human reckoning. Preparation of the clipper for the adventure means that every piece of gear and equipment must be finally checked and compactly stored. This craft becomes the only home these men will know for the next few months. Their only refuge against storms and angry seas. Therefore, it must be stocked with not only the standard provisions, but with everything from medical supplies to movie films for the comfort and welfare of the fishermen. Every piece of gear and equipment has a reason for being. It must function. And it must remain secure against damage or it will not function when needed. These men make a simple routine out of what would be the adventure of a lifetime to the average man. They've been chosen because they're well adjusted to this life and because they respect the rights of the other men with whom they must live and work. It's not unusual for the wives and families of the men to gather on the pier for the departure, for unlike the ordinary husband who goes to his job daily, these men will be gone from three to four months, sometimes longer. Manuel Silva has been fishing for 50 years. Carl Sores, the skipper, whose family boasts generations of fishermen, gives the signal to start the engine. The is the last inspection. And so, the voyage begins. a final farewell to their loved ones as the clipper points her bow toward the breakwater and the open Pacific. And wherever tuna abounds, so goes our clipper, chicken of the sea. Plots, of course, the water somewhere off the coast of Central America. First, we hope to find live bait at Macapulli, Mexico, in the Gulf of California. So the compass heading reads southeast. Since trapping live bait is our first mission, all hands turn to preparation for the catch. The most important single item is the net, which is carefully stacked in the skiff. The day dawns bright and clear as we finally reach the bait grounds. The ship's entire personnel have become well oriented, and each member of the crew goes about his duties with precision and efficiency. The first piece of equipment over the side is the bait receiver. The speedboat is lowered. And finally, the skiff 
loaded with the Since we intend fishing in warm, tropical we'll use anchoveta as bait because they are native to the same waters as the tuna. So our lookout studies each swell and ripple, hoping for signs of the little fish. The pelicans, too, regard anchoveta as a tasty morsel. And as we sight these strange-looking birds, we feel confident we are approaching live bait. Goonie birds in the vicinity also signify that anchoveta are around. More pelicans move in. We know now we're right on top of the bait. The netting operation begins as the boats start paying out the net. This is shallow water, not for the tuna clipper. When the net completely surrounds the school of Ancho, it's pulled in, trapping the bait inside. Here's an unwelcome stranger that causes the fisherman no end of trouble. We call him a one-finger shark because he nips off one finger at a time and, in spite of his small size, can rip a bait net to shreds. The skipper is alerted by radio that the catch is in and the speedboat no time in bringing up the bait receiver. This operation from the net to the receiver is dangerous not only to the crew but to the fish because anchoveta frighten easily and in panic do great themselves. When the bait receiver is full, it is towed with great caution back to the tuna clipper. Another equally hazardous transferring operation takes place. The whole has been filled with seawater, which is circulated to keep the bait alive. To the fisherman, the bait is known only as chum, and the man who handles it is the chummer. And 6,000 scoops of chum will be in the before we leave the bait grounds. As the bait is being gently transferred, pelicans drop down for a fish dinner. Unmindful of the men, they figure this is a feast for them alone. With the clippers hold, crammed full of anchoveta, we head south for the tuna. Life consists of waiting as well as working. But the men are resigned to it. Practiced it year after year. This man roughs his pole so his hands won't slip when he's landing those big fellows he's hoping for. And is making a squid. The squid is a large, single b whose shaft is embedded in feathers and wrapped with calf skin or dolphin skin. When it's thrown in the water, its actions resemble those squid, a cuttlefish the tuna like most of all. It's attached to the line with a fine steel wire leader. The day starts at 5 a.m. And the men are right on hand for that early breakfast of steak and p Lots of it. He's just as handy with a fishing pole as he is with a skillet. A masked man is constantly aloft in the crow's nest. Perhaps he'll sight porpoises as they leap in and out of the waves, hoping to feed on the small fish that the tuna drive to the surface. Now the man on the bridge scans the seas with high-power binoculars.
And this strong leather pad is used not only for protection, but as a socket for the pole. And with the precision of a highly trained team, the men move in preparation for the catch. The chummer goes to work throwing out the live bait. The tuna, in their frenzy for food, strike at anything, including the unbaited hooks. On they come, and with each flash of a pole, 20, 30, 50 pounds of tuna are tossed on deck. strangest phenomena, reserved only for fishermen. These are spinning porpoises, and they jump as high as 15 feet in the air. Uh-oh, that flashing white belly, that's no tuna. That's a shark. Our rights to the fish are being disputed by those savages of the ocean, the shark, the barracuda. He hit him, a fatal shot right in the spinal column. is as determined as he is deadly. Has been known to jump clear out of the water to grab a fish that's been hooked. Sharks have even jumped onto the racks with the fishermen. He searches about underwater, ready to make a ferocious pass, slicing with a razor-like accuracy. The barracuda is just as deadly. One of the fastest swimmers in the sea. He, too, is waiting to move in on the unwary tuna. Another shark is hooked. As he's brought on board, it can be seen plainly why he frightens the tuna. His teeth are like razors. Then, as though bearing out the fears of the fishermen, the tuna vanish as suddenly as they appeared. They seek the refuge of the deep to escape the killers. is not over. The fish are quickly consigned to the quick freeze brine below decks. And we have aboard more than 60 tons of the tastiest meat that ever came from the depths of the ocean. Once the catch is consigned to the hold, the men will have a well-deserved rest. But first, a dinner that matches the Queen Mary, then a lot of conversation about that big one that got away. Starlit night on the tropical sea finds them in various forms of relaxation. Some gather on the boat deck for a musical serenade. Some sit about reading or writing letters home. Still others break the strain by watching one of the films they brought on the trip. fishermen have strong religious attachments and spend time in the chapel before retiring. More days and more miles as the clipper pushes further south in search of more tuna. The skipper sights some big fellows on the horizon and moves the clipper toward the school. To handle the larger ones, the men fish as a team, two, three, and even four poles on a common line. Even then, it taxes all their strength to pull 150 pounds of fighting fury out of the water. Tuna, 
called by Zane Gray the tiger of the sea, have a voracious appetite. And they strike like a whirlwind. tons of tuna, and our clipper heads for home. Now on the trip home, a heavy accent again is placed on cleanliness. The clipper is washed down from stem to stern. Every fitting is polished, and all the gear is returned to its rightful place, compactly and securely stored. As our clipper moves back up the line, the seas get heavy. It's always an omen. There's weather ahead. With several hundred tons of tuna aboard, the clipper rides low in the water. Our decks are awash the entire time we're off the coast of Mexico. Finally, after days of being tossed by the storm, we enter San Diego Harbor. Home is the fisherman, home from the sea. The first step in processing and preparing the tuna for the family table is this trip from the deep freeze hold of the clipper. The fish travel by way of a large sluice to the weighing table. Like so many chunks of ice, they are carefully weighed. The trip is then continued as the tuna take their last swim to the huge thawing pens where, immersed in pure salt water, the fish are slowly thawed out. A quick flash of a razor-sharp blade and the viscera is deposited in a special container to be sent to the reduction plant. After butchering, the tuna are inspected and racked for cooking. according to size to ensure proper length of cooking time, which ranges from one to 10 hours at a temperature of 218 degrees Fahrenheit. From the cooker, the tuna is taken to the cooling room where it is left overnight. Another journey takes the tuna to one of the many long rows of cleaning tables where hundreds of white-gowned women take over the important step of cleaning and scraping, leaving only the choice loins for packing. The head, skin, bones, and even the dark meat are consigned to the reduction plant for scientific processing. These experts prepare the loins for the chopper, which cuts them for fancy or chunk-style packs. This piece of precision mechanism is aptly called the guillotine. It fashions morsels of the tender meat for chunk-style packs. New and improved methods of processing and packing are constantly sought for and achieved. And although there's very little margin for error in the precision filling of each can, it is tested for weight before oil is added. Thus, the entire trip from cooker to canning is a matter of minutes. Then, just enough of nature's finest vegetable oils is added to preserve the flavor and the delicate texture of the fish. Like a parade of tin soldiers, the cans move in single file to be capped and sealed at the rate of five per second. Baskets are rolled into the giant retorts where the tuna, can and all, is subjected to a temperature of 242 degrees Fahrenheit for 80 minutes. And this one bank of retorts alone is capable of cooking a quarter of a million cans at the same time. 
After being cooled in these metal baskets, the cans are given a final inspection for weight and for proper vacuum. Then spot checks are made of the meat itself. When the lot has passed final inspection, the cans travel to the unscrambler, which in turn feeds them onto an elevator. Then they are gravity fed into a labeling machine which sends them to the packing cases at 480 a minute. The end of the line, but only in the packing house. For now, the tuna, delicious light meat in chunk style or the solid pack is ready to be shipped by case or carload to the dealer's shelf. And here is the prize of the fisherman, ready to become the most versatile performer in your kitchen. Which will it be, chunk style or solid pack? Which will it be? Well, if you're planning to serve tuna salad, either the solid pack or the chunk style will be just right. Dusty tuna combined with lettuce and spinach or with carrots and beets. Simple to prepare and simply delicious. So is this tomato surprise, stuffed with tidbits of tuna and celery or green peppers. Let's see what one solid pack can will do. Serve it hot as tuna chop suey. Inexpensive, and in addition to its nutritional values, there is that touch of exotic glamour. Serve it cold as a molded tuna salad. Fancy enough for any buffet. To prepare this tuna cream dip, use either the solid pack or chunk style. Most people prefer the chunk style combined with a little sour cream, horseradish, and onion salt. Use it in fish cakes, hors d'oeuvres, canopies, spreads, and of course, a heaping plate of tuna sandwiches is sure to please. Unless you run out. And for the party on the patio, or for that picnic in the park. Don't forget the barbecue style of tuna dishes. The whole sandwich can be wrapped in foil and grilled, or the meat itself can be sizzled to a golden brown. And tuna is now available in a dietetic pack, prepared and canned under the most rigorous scientific control. And of course, strained tuna in special baby packs is considered highly beneficial for infant feeding. And what mother doesn't always insist on giving her baby only the best in nourishing food for healthy bodybuilding? Its meal-making magic lends itself in a thousand ways to easy-to-prepare, low-cost, elegant meals. you think of tuna, look for the mermaid on the label. A seltzer Plus, so now you can relieve your cold and cough together. Introducing Alka-Seltzer Plus cold and cough medicine.